something interesting has happened. In the past 30 days, YouTube is telling me I've gained the same amount of subscribers as I did in my first five years on YouTube. That is kind of wild. This is now my 10th year of making videos and putting them on this channel. And in the last 30 days, there being 10,000 more of you, I'm realizing that, that all of you aren't gonna go back and watch my earlier videos. And there's a lot of questions about what is actually going on here on this channel. And I feel like I can uh, knock a bunch of them out. We're gonna talk about why I don't think it's actually worth it uh, to try to be famous on YouTube. We're gonna talk about a problem that I'm currently having with my shipping container conversion. The third thing, we're also gonna address how it is that I make my money and a bunch of other questions that you asked me on Instagram. Actually, real quick here, someone special is here. My younger brother, James. And James, what's your special relation to the channel? What achievement do you hold? I was a 10,000th subscriber. You're looking at him right here. <laughs> this is the guy, number 10,000. Does that make you feel good? Makes me feel special. <laughs> One of the questions I get uh, in a bunch of comments, especially when it's like van life travel stuff is, hey, like why isn't it the Janelle and Levi channel? And my wife doesn't want a channel, doesn't, doesn't want to, doesn't care to. And that's a good enough reason. <laughs> Levi, what's one or more feature inside the van you would never change? Uh, investing heavily in an electrical system. Uh, I use the van for work and having power is so important. What happened to the sailboat uh, that you were time sharing on Vancouver Island? Well, we moved off Vancouver Island and the boat was sold. So that's what happened to it. Would be interesting to hear how everything on the van slash build has been holding up. Yeah, I should do that. I should actually do a proper tour of the van, which I've actually never done on the channel. Um, and I should talk through how things are holding up. When to start raising prices for paid work and when slash if to do things for free. I talk about the latter philosophy in my workshop. And essentially what I mean is, especially when you're starting out, if you only get paid $1,000 to do a video, do that video as if you were getting paid $2,000. So that way the next time around when you're trying to prove to someone that you're worth paying $2,000 to make a video, you have a video that actually shows that kind of quality. And obviously there's a lot of nuance there, but I think uh, just go, go all in on doing the videos the best that you can over deliver and then never do it at that price again. I also did a whole podcast conversation with Tyler Stallman, uh, specifically a massive section on my philosophy of free work and how I approach that because I think it can be massively leveraged or massively abused. So uh, I would definitely check that out. How to find a good place to become a videography apprentice. Whew, uh, that's a good one. A uh, thing that I would probably do is find someone whose work that I like and then uh, try to find a way to, to do a day of work with them where it's very clear what you could offer. Uh, I don't think it's very helpful to send out all these messages of like, hey, I'll do anything for you, just like let me know. Uh, as someone who gets sent that message a bunch, I'm grateful for it, but I never know tangibly how to take up people on that. So I'm a big fan of showing up. Uh, so a way that I did that in the past is a production company I liked was selling a hard drive and I bought it and I went there in person and picked it up. Uh, and by buying their hard drive, that bought some of their time. And I said, hey, I'd love to help do this on your next shoot. I can operate a camera, I can do this. I'd love to be involved. What dates can we schedule? How to organize the year's worth of data you have, how to back them up when traveling. Uh, there could probably be a full video there on the specifics. Uh, the simplest way to think about it is just have it on two hard drives. So for me, I have uh, a bunch of these eight terabyte drives and they're numbered and each one is an A and a B copy and the B copy is a clone of what's on drive A. Three spots is better, but two spots at a minimum. How to start in outdoor filmmaking. I have no idea. Uh, for me, I started by making the kinds of things that I wanted to get paid to make and that was, that was challenging because not many people were lining up to pay me to make them and it's been a long process. So maybe don't do it the way I did it. I don't know. So container stuff. Uh, on the container videos, we have gotten a lot of questions, which is just a lot of fun. Some of them are just more than I'll be able to answer, but some people were suggesting that for the that we should pick it up with a flatbed. Uh, and I don't know if I clarified as good as I could have, um, this driveway to come down with a flatbed to drop off this container when it was empty, when we got it delivered was very sketchy, like so sketchy. We were about six inches from the top of my landlord's house there. 
which was not a good feeling. <laughs> so I promised when this thing gets picked up, uh, we would use a crane truck. So I know some of you were wondering about that. Uh, as far as painting the roof, yeah, we'll get to it. Um, solar, definitely, there's a lot of different ideas around that. So thanks for all the suggestions because I'm just kind of excited for the potential with this space. Um, why haven't we uh, uploaded another video yet? Well, we're, uh, we're waiting for some parts because I'm gonna make some changes because some of you had concerns about the safety uh, either in the short term, term or in the long term and I wanna try address some of those. So I have some ideas and I'm gonna try implement them uh, but they're gonna take a little bit of time and uh, I need to wait for those to get in. And I'm, I'm confident with the design and the safety of it for now but I do certainly understand where some people are coming from and I wanna, I'm gonna address some of that. So we're gonna make more videos about that and just so you know like, the container videos are just going to be sprinkled in as we find time and money to invest in working on it and it's just going to be a part of the regularly scheduled programming around here. <laughs> the inside space is coming together really well. Obviously I'll show this in future videos. We've got uh, cubbies and organizers starting to come in and it feels so exciting to have a space to customize because the last like five to 10 build projects that I've done, I haven't had my own space to do them, either doing them in the driveway of my last landlord's place. Um, I haven't had my own shop ever. And being able to set it up the way that I want, uh, I'm excited about. There's a lot of things that I have to do and it's entirely chaotic right now. Like it's completely chaotic. And that's a little bit overwhelming because a lot of the stuff we had in storage while we were traveling in our van, I now have to figure out if I'm gonna get rid of it or not. And then the mixture of all the film equipment I own, just trying to like find good processes and places to put things. I aspire to be an organized person, but the work required to get there is just so immense, especially when there's lots of things that you're interested in. Uh, so hopefully we'll get there soon because I'm a little bit tired of living in the chaos of stuff everywhere. What's not a mess and which I find easy to organize is staying on top of managing my website with the sponsor of this video and that is Squarespace. So that's where I showcase all my work for the production company. That's also where clients reach out to me to schedule meetings, to talk about projects and having that contact button right there on the main page of my website is super helpful. And then they can schedule a meeting with me and it all is just seamlessly built into this wonderful website building platform. I recommend having a home base that you can point people towards and Squarespace is a great tool to do that. You can pick one of their amazing designer templates as a starting place. And then if you have any hiccups along the way, they have award-winning customer support that is super helpful if you have any questions. So for me personally, what I did is just start a trial and put all my images in and just see what it looks like. And I was, I was excited. And so I started being a customer of Squarespace long before they were a sponsor because I really liked the end results and how easy it was to use. And I think if you've been putting off starting a website, you'll be surprised how easy it is to do with Squarespace. Make sure to use my code for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Cost breakdown of the van. Uh, I originally bought the van for $7,900 Canadian plus tax. And then I immediately sold the aluminum shelving out of it for $1,500. So that was my upfront cost of the van. I've put about $5,000 in the seven-ish years, six or seven years that I've owned it into just general repairs. Things like radiator stuff, hoses, brakes, that kind of thing. Just like general maintenance and repair, replacing alternators. Uh, upgrades to the physicality of the van, I'm easily in five to fifteen thousand dollars probably closer to fifteen thousand things like wheels suspension bumpers i've invested a lot into that aspect the build itself uh easily easily between 20 and 30 would be my guess um i haven't actually done the numbers but i've tried to not do the numbers because it's a lot it takes a lot of money to build a van in the way that we did where it has as advanced of a power system and then also just all the extra stuff it just like a fridge is like a thousand dollars like everything just adds up and adds up and adds up and suddenly you've spent a lot of money that's all in canadian maybe someday i should do like a proper breakdown of pricing but that's where that's where that's how much the van costs <laughs> growing up i maybe worked four or five different jobs uh having a paper route uh, cooking french fries cooking popcorn at the local hockey rink uh, working in bike shops working at outdoor stores uh, and i realized pretty quickly through most of those that that i that i wanted to do my own thing that i wanted to kind of try start a business or something like that 
when I was young in my teenage years, I thought I wanted to build like a business business, like hundreds of people kind of business. And thankfully I, I realized probably around 17 or 18 that actually that wasn't really cut out for me. And what I had been experimenting with, the reason why I even started this YouTube channel was just making videos. And so I was trying to envision a life where I could just make videos that I wanted to make. And I thought, you know, why don't I give this a shot of trying to do the hobby for the job? And that's where I was brainstorming names and I wanted to start a little production company. So this bear that you see around on the channel, that's actually the logo for my production company, uh, Left Coast Media House. And uh, essentially it's still what it started as and it's mainly just me. <laughs> and what I specialize in is for adventure companies or clients or businesses, I can show up with a small camera and then I can direct and shoot a whole video for them. This has enabled some really cool shoot opportunities. Not all of them are awesome, but I love working with sailing clients. I got to film with some of the boats from Pirates of the Caribbean, which was just a big highlight. I've gotten to do a lot of really cool, random outdoor things for sometimes helping out on a TV show or in the instance of this awesome hot air balloon production where there was a slackliner going between hot air balloons. But what I describe my skill set from a work perspective as being best at is figuring out a way that we can make a story about uh, that's got some real life elements to it. So more of that documentary-esque, but shaping it in a way that it's actually helpful for the company that's paying for it. So that way it can benefit them and they can justify spending money on it. And so getting out on the dinghy that you saw earlier was actually part of my work because right now I'm location scouting and prepping stuff for a shoot that I have coming up. And those shoots often don't make it on the YouTube channel because it takes a lot of work to do the shoots and then to add video on top of that that I'm just doing for YouTube. It's just, it's a lot to manage, especially when I'm rolling with a small crew. So I just don't normally do that, but uh, that's what the kayaks and stuff's going on in my car. When I was repacking the dinghy back in the vehicle, this gas tank tilted over just so, and now there's gas that seeped all into my dinghy bags and they're completely soaked with fuel. So I'm gonna have to spend a lot of today unpacking this stuff and getting, trying to get the, trying to get the gasoline out of it, which I'm not too happy about. But some of you were very curious about this dinghy Zodiac setup in my last video where I was camping with my daughter and introducing the birth of my son. So if you didn't know that my son was born, he's born Jasper Finn. You should go watch that video. Uh, some of you had questions about like the setup. So it reeks of fuel right now, which is a big bummer. Uh, I think most of the fuel, it's not actually that much fuel, but it just smells worse than it is. But some of you were asking in the comments how small it folds down. So the main boat portion of it is this. So this is kind of like the boat. And then I bought another accessory bag over here, which holds things like the aluminum seats and the aluminum floorboards. It's important for me in the videos that I upload to my channel that I reflect on the fact that they don't always encapsulate the full picture of what running your own small business looks like. In my everyday carry adventure video I just published, I reflected on how much time I actually spend behind a computer and how that is easily one of my least favorite things. And now that I have two children, I've definitely been processing and trying to learn about how best to go forward with still making work that I'm actually proud of. That's why sometimes on the channel, I just hit record and get personal with you all. That layer is important to me. I'm going to talk more about YouTube and if I think it's actually worth all the hassle in a moment. But a scene that we cut from the Everyday Carry video that I really liked was me stopping in to visit at my friend RJ's studio in town. Knock, knock, knock. Much. Doing the, the tour of the valley today. Nice. Seeing all the spots and the friends. Good to see you, bro. Because at the rental basement suite, uh, my computer's in a hallway. Sometimes I just go a little bit crazy there, so it's nice to get out to coffee shops or friends' studio spaces. And uh, I bring by something to ride on and, and camp out here every once in a while to get some work done. I like this moment a lot because both of our video careers started at around the same time. They've diverged, they've done different things, but I've always just really appreciated having someone local that I've got roots with to reflect on and talk about what it is that we're trying to build. How old would we have been shooting some of those first weddings? Would that have, uh, you would have been, 
Because that was grade 11 or grade 12? That would have been, no, not grade 12. That would have been grade 10 or 11. Yeah, so, I don't know, what is that? 15? This is funny. Those are, those are the best days, man. You had the yellow, the yellow ranger. Mm -hmm. um, and you just started making iPhone videos on YouTube. And yeah. you were like, dude, this YouTube thing. Yeah, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna make a video once a week at least. <laughs> I'm gonna make this series. I'm like, sweet. That sounds awesome. And then when you're when you're trying to tell people when you're like graduating what you're doing after high school, that was bad. And yeah. you're like telling people, yeah, I'm gonna do video, and people are just like, like for for movies. And yeah, you can do weddings. They need like the news. <laughs> and now now it's great that it's just so much more normalized. But yeah, it, it certainly was comforting knowing that there's at least someone else in the Fraser Valley that was doing some version similar, that was stoked on outdoor stuff, that had aesthetics on lock. Right. And that was just that well, was I think, cool. I think we both just had, we didn't have the exact vision of what it was right. going to look like, but we both had the confidence that whatever this looks like, we'll be able to make a living from it. We'll be able to right. do fine. Like, there's something here. RJ actually uh, has got a workshop right now that I think is just killer with Wildest Co. Everything about, everything this guy knows about cinematography, aesthetics, how to tell a story with visuals, he's putting together right now with, it just this great, highly edited, highly executed, it's really well done. My whole ideology of like filmmaking and like why stories are important, yeah. how do we find stories, how do we keep that fire alive during a project, which yeah. I always used to be, able, like I would just get fizzled out and, and lose my fire and, yeah. and and yeah, there's a lot of big things, a lot of big things. I mean, we both get such a kick out of education, which is fun. Yeah. You, so we're doing sailing workshops again this year. We're like actually announcing them right now. That's so sweet. You got you and sailing with us last year. Oh yeah. Of like, it's, as far as adventures go, top five days for sure for me. Cause it's like the most beautiful place in BC and then wherever else too, it's crazy. So I don't I'll know how many spots are open, but you should freaking get on a boat with this guy. I'll flash up some of uh, the film stills you took from last time because those still just get me amped up. Yeah. The stuff that RJ shoots on film. I, again, I just go follow RJ on Instagram. It's it's on point. Thanks, buddy. I want to talk about YouTube stuff, but it's got to be anchored in the previous conversation of what I do to make money. Uh, I knew it was gonna be a delicate balance when I was taking my hobby and also using that to try to turn into a business. And what, what's the saying? It's like, uh, what's the quickest way to kill your passion? Try to make money with it. So I've tried to be non-romantic about the idealized version of what this could look like in so much as I'm using something that I care about as a craft and trying to make money with it. And that's, that's challenging because I wanted to build a company that made enough money that I could make my own things. I didn't want to have to rely on other people's money to do that. I wanted to run a small business that was good enough, that had enough money so that way I could go out and just make little stories that I wanted to make. And to be fair, this pursuit of video has unlocked just more opportunities to satisfy my curiosity than anything else I've experienced. Uh, but when I look at myself in like my own identity, I don't see myself as being like a filmmaker first uh, or even a YouTuber first, especially not a YouTuber or an influencer first. I see myself more as being like a maker first. So I started my little production company and there was a point where I had to decide, do I double down, hire on people, get a studio and build like a production house? I guess Media House is the name of my company, but I had to make a call. Like, do I want to grow this as like, with staff uh, and I made the call no and I've deliberately kind of kept it as a smaller thing because I'm not sure I'd, I would actually enjoy very much the process of having to manage all that goes along with something bigger and maybe that might change someday but right now that's what it is and what that allows me to do is that if I'm strategic about how we're spending money expenses wise uh, and if we make great work that our clients are happy to invest in Hopefully there's some spare time and money to make some of my own things. When it comes down to YouTube, like I started putting finished pieces of video on YouTube and then people would ask me all these questions about how to make it. 
And then that's where I kind of like started to take people along in this experience vlog form of, hey, this is just things that I'm interested in right now. It's not my, it's not my sole source of income. It's not the main thing that I do. It's a part of what I do. It's where I get to share my finished things, but it's not like the top thing. And that's important to me because honestly, like the idea of having going after it with a YouTube channel, um, I don't know how you think about channel sizes and that kind of thing, but, uh, the idea of going after building a large channel and becoming like YouTube famous, I don't look down on that as a pursuit, but I think I've learned enough about myself at this point in my life that I know that that's not what I want for me. And what I do want for me is to finish videos that I'm proud of, especially like the short film stuff, like the, the regular uploads, yes, I wanna be proud of those, but the extra special videos, like the, the birth of my daughter film, the slacklining stuff, you know, the one wheel film, like those kinds of things. I, I would love for there to be a group of people that get to experience that video and get to see some of my excitement for the way that I, I look at life. I'd love, I'd love for people to see those. And the best way that I know how to get those in front of people is YouTube. So I'm endlessly grateful, but I'm also very cautious about having YouTube be my biggest ambition, if that makes sense. Like if, I, if that's what I'm going after, it feels like there's less things that I personally have control of to make that a success. And if I've learned anything, it's that things are outside of my control. If I say those are important for me to feel satisfied, feel happy, feel grateful, uh, that's setting myself up for disappointment. So I try to personally set my goals on, this is turning like into self-help crap. I just can't help myself because I, I think about this stuff a lot. But uh, for me personally, I try to set my goals around things that I have the opportunity to show up and actually do. And then the extraneous things around that is just like what's what happens. So I did mean it five years ago when I made a video that said I don't want to be famous on YouTube and I still don't. Uh, I, I don't want it to be my biggest thing. Uh, I'm frankly not that good at coming up with new ideas and new concepts and titles. Like that's, that's not my strongest skill set and it kind of wears me out a little bit trying to do that game well. And so I'd way rather if this just stayed a playground and I can make things that I like. And with all aspects of my life, as someone who likes uh, business and, and investing in tools to do it well with work and things like that, I want, I like figuring out ways to make money with it. And so of course that's where I put in sponsors and I try to like monetize it because it takes a massive time investment. So don't hear me, don't hear me here that I don't wanna be making money from my YouTube channel. And I also know if the YouTube channel grows, that means I make more money. But I also am so aware of like if the YouTube channel grows like massively much bigger at a rate that I'm not able to keep up with uh, headspace wise, that is probably going to burn me out in a really big way. And then maybe I'll have to walk away from the channel altogether. And I don't want that. So I guess that's kind of what I mean when I say I don't want to be famous on YouTube, because honestly, I'm really satisfied with what it is. Like I, of course, appreciate the when a video does well and when new people are coming, like I, I love that energy too, but that to me isn't the goal, um, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm okay that I have to run a company and make money with it in order to save up, to spend time on the road. And then even when I am on the road, I have to like work on the road. I, I'm okay with that. That's a pretty, that's a pretty all right trade off. And the building up to that was a decade of time trying to get the pieces in play. And it, uh, it took a lot of work and we have to spend chapters where we're not doing anything that exciting just to like save up for the next step. And that's just, that's just the reality of life. Okay, I wanted to close off this section briefly with some questions about the Adventure Film Academy workshops. Uh, some of you had questions. So what are those? What's happening uh, in September, end of September? I'm taking some of you out sailing with me and the whole topic of the trip is how to become better adventure storytellers. Uh, everyone is welcome. I have a questionnaire to try see like if you're a good fit. And some of you are asking like, who is the trip best for? How much experience do I need? Uh, depending on who applies in a given year, we shape who goes on which trip differently. Uh, you don't need much experience to go on the trip, uh, but from a starting point, it's helpful to have made videos. <laughs> it's helpful to have gone through the process of having an idea in your head and trying to turn that into finished video form. Uh, people who are just wanting to pick up a camera for the first time, this might not be the best scenario for you, uh, but you don't need to have like done this for your job. You don't even need to like the work that you're currently doing. That probably actually applies to most of us. Uh, but it's helpful if you've tried to make some videos and that's a great starting point because uh, most of what the topics are, are addressing how to approach and how to think about finding story 
developing it as you're shooting it, how to think about shooting it, and how to shape that into an edit afterwards. And then there's a lot of downtime where we can do other little sessions on things like doing this for money, um, how to do it with clients, how to do the revision process. Like there's other little modules that will sneak in, like an internet video vlogging module, like whatever people are most interested in, that's what we spend time on. But it's a proper adventure. We're going sailing, we get out into the outdoors. It's just an amazing time, it's so cool. And uh, I really love sailing. But yeah, the applications are officially opening today. So I would, if you're interested, head on over there to the website for more info about them. If you have more questions, happy to answer. Uh, we sell out every single year. So don't delay filling out an application if you're interested. And then how it works is I go through all of them and then I extend invitations uh, to a group of people. And I kind of have this back and forth with them to make sure that it's all gonna work out. And then uh, usually most of the people I extend those first invitations to accept them. And then that's a full trip. So. Uh, unfortunately, that means there's a bunch of people every year that don't get to go, but we're trying to find more space. And if there's enough interest this year, maybe we get uh, another trip on the calendar. So that's the Adventure Film Academy workshops.